Viktor Frankl said, Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson. Stay tuned for the next hour as Sue explores the human psyche, what makes us tick and how to live better, more fulfilled and more meaningful lives. Only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson on the Finding Human program on 101.9 Chai FM. I'm very excited today to introduce my guest to you. It is Sebo Villakazi, and we are connecting. He's in Durban, and I'm in the studio in Johannesburg. Hello, Sebo. Can you hear me? I can, Sue. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And it's so good to see you. It really is. We've got an exciting program that we want to discuss with everybody. But just let me introduce Sebo for those of you who haven't heard him before. You're in for a treat. Uh, if you would like to look up previous podcasts, please do so under the High FM Finding Human uh, podcasts. And um, also, if you'd like to make contact with him on LinkedIn, he's got fantastic articles. They are really suggest that whoever wants to know more about South Africa, about uh, living, about being themselves, to actually read Sebo's uh, different articles. Now, Sebo introduces himself always as a peace farmer. And his mom, even when he was a little boy, said that he would rush out and help everybody uh, to pick up parcels and carry them. So he's always been a person who has reached out to others. And he, uh, well, I think it was last year or the year before, um, that you won the, the International Distinguished Toastmasters Award. And you're still an active member uh, as a Toastmaster, aren't you, Sebo? I am. Was it last year? Yeah. Uh, it was. Yeah, I think it was January of 2023 that I got the award. Oh, fantastic. And then uh, he's an author of uh, books and poems. Uh, he, he has facilitated many discussions in the workplace and at schools on diversity and inclusion and leadership. He's the ideal person to actually invite to be a motivational uh, speaker. And uh, he is a person of compassion. And the Dalai Lama said that uh, it's the wish to see others free from suffering. That is compassion. And that's what we're going to be talking about today on the many unbelievable decisions that Sebo has made lately. Sebo, I would like to start by, first of all, welcoming you, obviously, but you made a major decision this year. Will you please tell us what it was? Thank you very much, Sue. And uh, I think I said earlier that it's always a pleasure to be on your show. And thank you for having me. The decision was actually made last year. And uh, that was to apply for the position of member of parliament or member of the provincial legislature for the Democratic Alliance. And uh, it was the, the application process started in May of 2023. And to be honest, I really didn't believe I was going to get in anyway. It was really because in a manner of speaking, I lost a bet with, 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 with someone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and, and the thing was, if you're gonna stop complaining about the politics in the country, then here's your opportunity to do something about it. Wow, and, what a um, challenge. Yeah, so what happened was that at the, after the election, it turned out that I was, the elections were in May 2024, for those who may not know. It turned out that I was in an electable position. And so now I find myself in the position of member of parliament for the Democratic Alliance or the DA. That's absolutely amazing. You know, congratulations and uh, what an incredible achievement. But going back to that, you were always very suspicious of the D DA and really very anti the DA. Tell me why. Uh, I was anti-politicians uh, to start off with. Right. And then even more so uh, DA politicians because the, the DA... 
uh, especially for someone like myself who considered himself to not be interested in politics, except I, I, I needed to have an interest in politics because there had so much impact on the work that I was doing. But outside of that, so to that extent, I was interested. I, I needed to know who was the president, who was minister of such and such, often because I needed to interact with them. But then beyond that, I really didn't trust politicians. I didn't like politicians. And I trusted the DA even less, mm-hmm. but particularly because, or specifically because it has a reputation as a, a, a white party. You know, and it comes from a tradition of predominantly white, to predominantly be a white membership mm. and even targeting a white audience. And so that was my the reason for my initial hesitation. And, you know, it must have. Did you discuss it with family? Did, were, were they um, supportive of you joining the, the DA or did they suggest joining other parties and making a difference in that way? You know, I actually didn't let my family know up, uh-huh. until, <laughs> up until it became clear that I had a very good chance. This was around November, December last year, when I, when I got invited now to the next stage of the process, which was really now to say, um, this is the, almost the final group of people that are going through for shortlisting. And suddenly it hit me that this thing was real because earlier on, remember I said to you, I, it was really against my better judgment even mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. get involved in the first place. So I didn't tell them because I thought I was going to fall out anyway. And so it wouldn't really make any difference. Wow. So when once it did make a difference, you know, I, the one um, article that you, you put on LinkedIn, which I thought was a very true article, was why join the, the DA? And you said you were very conflicted when st- you started completing the application. And, uh, and you, that, uh, it, that this is a sentiment that the DA has heard before from black applicants. And you said, I've disliked, the, you had disliked the DA on principle. My view has always been that it's a racist party that promotes the interests of white people. So what made you change your mind? Or, re- it was, or, it, it, or think it, differently anyway? Mm? It was a few things, Sue. And that writing that statement, so the DA in its application asks you when you apply, to write a personal statement, a motivation to say as to why you are making the application. And it helped me because I really thought about it for a period. It took me a, possibly a week, if not more, to put that together. But I, I had to think about why I was writing. So firstly, it was because I, I, my... my um, Dislike for the DA had, was never really more than surface level, really. It was just based on the things that I heard in the news, conversations with, with, with people close to me, but never really uh, had I looked at the DA in any detail. And so I did that. As part of this process, to start off the application, I went online, looked at their policies, looked at the things that they were doing, and I started to get impressed. Also, I had this friend that was pushing me and telling me about the good things that the DA was doing. Firstly, just the mere fact that as an outsider, I could apply. That really came as a surprise. Uh, I know certainly from many of the bigger, uh, the other parties, you have to have come through the level of the branch, et cetera, et cetera. You have to be a well-known comrade before you can even be considered for such positions. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they, the DA invited people from outside was, was, was pretty big for me. And we- then... Can we get back to that shortly? Yeah. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, I'm back again with uh, Sebo Belakazi. If you'd like to contact us, please do so on WhatsApp on 61 Um This is Sue Jackson. And we're continuing talking about Sebo Bilakazi's decision to apply for a position in the DA. Now, you had been alarmed about what was going on and the conditions in our country at the time. Was that one of the reasons why you decided that you were going to? Almost. 
I'm sorry, Sue. Sorry, I cut you off. No, that you were you were going to step forward and do something about it. Most definitely. I, I live in uh, Durban, and I love the city. And uh, I, I have just been so alarmed at how drastically and how quickly it's deteriorated. Things aren't working. And I found myself actually been wanting to semigrate to Cape Town. Mm. And, um, and, you know, in the end, I realized that, no, I, I actually I don't want to go to Cape Town and that, you know, we need people to stay here and fix the city. So that was the one other reason. Another reason is the book you mentioned. I am an author of a book called Who Shall Stand? Mm. And the title mm. poem is really a, a call to action for men and women of compassion and, mm. and those who would um, take up arms in a manner of speaking and work to make things better, not just for themselves, but for citizens at large. And so I felt if it means that I've got to join the DA to do this, then that's what I'm going to do mm. because I'm the one that tells people uh, to do this. I also felt very strongly that the best way to change the trajectory of the country was to remove the ANC from power. And against, even though it pained me to, to, to have to admit this, but the only sensible <laughs> route to do this, in my view, was, was the DA. Mm. It has the infrastructure, it has the size, but most importantly, it has the will to attempt anyway, much better than any other party that I saw, to really do some to do good by the vast uh, by the vast majority of the of the population. So those are just some of the reasons that eventually led me to saying, "I'm going to I'm going to do this." And so when you were sworn in, I see you were with your mom. And, and by the way, I wanted to tell your mom, um, Mrs. Busiziwe, is that right, Vilakazi? Okay. I would like to say to you, well done. You've brought up an incredible son to make a difference in the world. And, you know, you've done your job as a mom incredibly well. I've got a photo of you in front of me, actually, because uh, Sebo said, proud to be accompanied by my mom for my swearing in as a member of the seventh parliament of the Republic of South Africa today. What a huge achievement. It really is. You know, uh, Sebo, uh, Rabbi uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who, uh, if you haven't heard of him before, you, you would enjoy his YouTubes. Unfortunately, he has passed away during COVID. But what he said is, I believe that what elevates us in life is not what we receive, but what we give. The more of ourselves that we give, the greater we become. And I think that's very much what you are doing. You are giving yourself. Now, what constituency have you been dis uh, assigned to? Um, first of all, just thank you so much for those words, um, Sue. And I wanted to say to you that my mom's actually here with me. She oh, that's just, lovely. <laughs> so she's <laughs> listening to this interview as we speak, and um, she, she waves. Uh, uh, <laughs> tell her I'll wave back to her. <laughs> what a kind comment, and thank you, thank you very much. I have been assigned the constituency of Umkanyagute, this is within KZN. So maybe first of all, just to point out for those who may not be aware that the role of a member of parliament consists primarily of two roles, of two parts. The first one is the obvious one, the better known one of being in parliament, making laws and spending a lot of time in Cape Town, in our case, in, in the parliament. But there's a second uh, role, which is uh, equally important and possibly more important, and that's that of being in your constituency or working with communities where, wherever you've been assigned. And so I've been assigned the rural communities of um, Umkanyagute. My role there is twofold. It's to grow support for the party, but also to take concerns from that community, from that constituency to parliament and ensure that they get addressed. 
Well, you know, that's a very good uh, position for you to be in because you were the, uh, I don't know if you're still involved with the Valley Trust uh, NGO in in the Midlands and you did incredible work there. So for you to take that work forward now into this new constituency is amazing. Did you have to give up your the, your position at the Valley Trust? I did, Sue. And you make the point about it being related to the work of the Valley Trust. In fact, part of why I could even find it in myself to take up on this role was that it enabled me to continue my activism. It just gave mm-hmm. me a different platform. So to me, I'm still doing pretty much the same work as before just on a different platform and on a much more impactful platform, I feel, because part of the frustration with being at the Valley Trust and and, and, and non-profit organization that's sort of locally based was firstly, the impact is only local. But secondly, it, it can be overwhelming and, and, and uh, discouraging to feel like you're fighting a system that is working against you, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of government policies and um the actions of government and how they impact directly impacted the work. Mm. And so now um, where I can influence to a limited extent, I'm sure, but it, uh, it's still I have the opportunity to influence how policy affects organizations such as the one that I, um, I was a member of before. So it's still a continuation, uh, but I've had to leave the role within the Valley Trust because this is a full-time job. And certainly you take your skills with you, which is amazing. Um, what, to, to you, what do you feel are your main um, challenges right now? I mean, I know that in the Durban area and the whole coastal area, it's, it's been the pollution, uh, it's been uh, all the shack dwellers without, without electricity, without water, and um, there's, there've been a lot of problems in that area. So, what do you feel are your main challenges as you take on this position? I I would see them at at two levels. On the one level, there's a societal, maybe uh, even if we were to characterize them regionally, uh, challenges within maybe the province. Uh, a big one was. Um, load shedding and thankfully mm-hmm. the government has managed to bring that under control for 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 now this crime there is just the, the this corruption rampant corruption and uh, which has a direct impact on service delivery mm-hmm. and then in fact in my role now as an mp i'm becoming even more aware of just how direct the impact of corruption particularly at the scale that it's uh, happening in what what direct impact it has. It literally takes away money that was going to pave a road, that was going to fix a reservoir, a water reservoir, that was going to bring electricity to a, to a place of corruption is a big one. Health and education are other two big challenges that are where services aren't happening in the way that they should. So that's the one I would say sort of from a regional point of view. Then there's uh, other challenges from my own role as a member of parliament, so my, uh, I said earlier, my main task is to grow the support of the DA where I am. But that's a, a rural community, high levels of of, um, of 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 poverty, and we don't really have much. From the po- point of view of the party, we don't have much of a budget to do our work. We've got to get mm-hmm. activists out, talking to community members, etc., and uh, unearthing these issues that we that we can then take up. Uh, with the government or with parliament, but we don't we, we don't have the resources to to mm. do that. And in fact, at another level, for me personally, I have uh, now now that I'm in as a member of parliament, I've got to make an, a, a contribution to the party. It's part of how the uh, party itself raises funds, and this happens actually across the board. Other parties do the same. I've got to pay um, candidate fees. Good heavens! <laughs> as, as I'm finding myself now owing the party to the tune of some 40,000 uh, uh, rand or, or, or thereabouts. And in fact, it's been unfortunate in that I started off as part of the application process. I needed to show that I was capable of fundraising. And so just through 
uh, my contacts and uh, reaching out to different people, I raised um, upward of 15,000 rand. So mm. that has helped to reduce the candidate fees, but I still have to Good. pay off the, the rest of it. Good heaven. So the DA actually don't help you to raise that money. You've got to do it yourself. You've got to raise it yourself. Mm. Constituency, the candidate fees, definitely, they are personal and directed at you. The uh, uh, constituency, there is a nominal budget that's given. But, for example, we've exhausted our budget for 23, for 2024, 2025. Wow. And we're all, only three months into the financial year. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. The, it's not much. And um, we really do uh, rely on local businesses and individuals mm-hmm. to help support uh, our work in this area. You know, on this, I would actually like to say, I very seldom do this on this program, but I would like to give out uh, Sebo's uh, WhatsApp number because if anybody listening in feels that they can contribute, whether it's uh, our overseas listeners or our, our listeners in South Africa, it would be wonderful if you could help uh, Sebo raise this money. What did you say? It's about 40,000 rand that's needed? Yeah, it is. And uh, it's Sebo's WhatsApp number is 072-439-6567. And uh, you, it would be wonderful if any of you could help. It would just be marvelous. Now, you know, with with South Africa is a, is a strange country, Sebo. We have had opportunities to, to leave. And my husband says, no, this is where his soul was meant to be. And this is where his soul will leave from. So he he is absolutely adamant he's not going anywhere. And I think, you know, uh, I read something that I think you once said, and it says we are Africans not because we are born in Africa, but because Africa is born in us. And that's very definitely what it is. If you talk to anyone who's immigrated, they will tell you that they long to get back to Africa, just to to feel Africa in their blood again, you know, pulse, pulsating through our blood. It's definitely there. But just tell me, when you went into your new constituency, was there a, a bit of suspicion that you, a black man, was coming in as a DA candidate. How did they feel about DA? Um, it's, uh, it's been um, illuminating to, to, to experience that. Too. And firstly, maybe just to make two points. Firstly, is that for people outside of South Africa, the, the country code is plus two seven. Is oh, there, right zero in the number that you gave and thank you so much that's very kind of you to to give out my uh whatsapp number i do indeed welcome and accept happily accept people looking to make contributions and the quote about africa i may have quoted it but it uh, certainly isn't mine originally and then in regard to this what we found so there is very much like i had the suspicion of anyone that would even support the da uh, particularly amongst black people. It's like, don't you have any sense of, um, you know, disgust with white people and what they've mm-hmm. done to black people in the country in the past? Mm-hmm. And uh, I do. And I expect, you know, I understand why people would uh, not like parties like the DA. But we don't even talk about that. We talk about people's daily lives, how... Mm-hmm. Do you have water? Did you have water to bath and drink and cook this morning? There's, there's potholes. Do you have a bridge to get? And, and, and I mean literal bridges across a road, across a river on a road, because those are some of the things that the government, our black government, has failed to do. And um, when, it, when it had the opportunity mm-hmm. and we can have many excuses. But in, in diversity, in the diversity training, Sue, uh, that I do with colleagues. One of the questions we often ask people who will have reservations about things is, ask yourself, what are you pretending not to know? Mm-hmm. Because many times we love to pretend like we can't see something. Mm-hmm. And so I find that a lot of the times as black people, we are so loyal to, for example, the ANC, 
that we think it is, you know, uh, sinful even to go against it. But deep down, we know that we don't deserve what they're giving to us. We don't deserve, uh, we, it, 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 okay, I, Take everything else away. We don't deserve to have. We don't deserve to have people steal our money Absolutely. and live yeah. lavish lives, and and then flaunt them in our faces mm. in the way that the ANC does. Mm. So when we bring the conversation down to people's daily lives and um, juxtapose that with the lavish lifestyles that we see on social media of the political elites, people are like, sign me up. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I hear you. And, and at the end of the day, people respond to that. that they are just looking for a way to uh, live, live better, see their children live better and um, enjoy the benefits of this hard won uh, democracy. Absolutely. And, you know, I must admit when you, you, you say that about, you know, the feeling of, of distrust coming through apartheid era myself. I think there's a there's always that sense of guilt of um, why did I not see what was going on? How did I not see what was going on? You know, what sort of excuse can I can I even make? Mm. And and I think ultimately we've got to stop and we've got to say, as white people, it did happen, and we have a responsibility now to make sure that the future for our children and our grandchildren is going to be a very different one to, to what we knew. And, uh, and it is that in, it's in many ways, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was saying in many ways, it's almost like survivor guilt, you know, that uh, if yeah. you've come through a war and you shouldn't have, that's, I think, as white people, we've also got to work, we've got to acknowledge that and our responsibility, and then move forward into a much better South Africa. And I think we have an opportunity of that beginning now. When we see what the latest elections showed, it was very exciting. There's yeah. a, you know, it's a, a new way of, of, of going on. This is Finding Human with Sue Jackson, only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson, and I'm with Sebo Vilakazi, and we are our, our topic actually was run your own race, and that's exactly what uh, Sebo has been doing: is this running his own race? Martin Luther King described the beloved community as a society where caring and compassion drive political policies that super- support the worldwide elimination of poverty and hunger and all forms of bigotry and violence. At its core, the beloved community is an engine of reconciliation. That was um, Martin Luther King. And I think that's very much what you're trying to do. Um, I would like you to please tell me and our listeners about your first speech as a parliamentarian. I love that. (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it was nerve-wracking and uh, for someone who's a Toastmaster and for those who, who don't know Toastmasters International is a club that trains in public speaking and leadership I've, uh, I've, I've, I've spoken many times I've made many public speeches to, to either to groups within like Toast, Toastmasters clubs uh, within the Toastmaster environment but also out, outside but I think just knowing that this is a whole different um, environment. It, this thing is being broadcast to the entire country and possibly abroad. Just add, added a, uh, a measure to it of nervousness and anxiety and excitement, really, <laughs> that um, got, was close to overwhelming. And so when I did read my speech, in fact, what I, what I made po- sure to do with my first one was read it word for word. I'm not a big fan of that. I believe you need to make a connection as a public speaker with your audience, including eye to eye and in other words. But this time I was just, you know what? I just want to make sure I get the words right, that I can get the words out of my mouth and that I say them in the way that I should. But in the end, it turned out to be not as um, daunting as I had feared and, and, and it went well. That was the first speech. Things right. were to get worse. Second. Tell me about the second. 
uh, and, and, uh, you know, the, I, I read something just as, as an aside. I read something just the other day, Sue. I, I had it here. Let me, let, me, let me look for it quickly. Okay. Where someone says embarrassment is the cost. Uh, the the entry cost of um, is is the cost of entry into anything. If you've never, if you uh, fear experiencing the embarrassment or that comes with being new, then you are never going to do anything. You are never going to be a master of anything because you've got to start from the you know from scratch. And so, with my second speech, I started to feel okay. Uh, I've done my first one. I, I want to make sure that I, I, I do what I know from Toastmasters, which is not rely so much on just reading on paper so much. I, I, I had just notes and um, bullet, in bullet points, so to speak. And as I started speaking, I then got to a part, things were going well until I got towards the end of my speech where I was talking about the DA difference. And of course, the members of the Mkonto um, party who were in the room took exception to this and there was a couple of EFF members there as well and they started you know heckling and jeering and I committed the cardinal error that I would have told anyone not to commit I paid attention to them how did you respond I did respond and that got me sucked in and it was just a downward spiral from there it didn't it it wasn't bad bad but I was totally unhappy with my own Mm-hmm. Uh, actions. I actually ended up saying to them, just, "Can you just shut up and let me continue?" <laughs> and when they, which of course I was then asked to withdraw so, <laughs> by the chairperson. <laughs> so uh, with uh, embarrassment, I had to withdraw, and I just uh, d- disliked the fact that here yeah, I am now having to apologize to these guys. These hecklers, <laughs> you know, have been nasty towards me, but I had to do it. It's part of the decorum of the house. And um, then I got back to my speech, but I had n- I had not written everything out in full. It was just scribbles and in notes, and I couldn't read my writing. So there were, I, I mentioned I said I was going to mention four points in closing. I could only see the three, but I think because of my nervousness, I'm I sure. couldn't read my writing for the fourth one. So <laughs> I, at some point, I kind of got, got stuck. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. But then I thought, okay, it's just going to have to be three points. So I, <laughs> so I, I closed off the speech. <laughs> like that. So it was getting back to the point about the embarrassment of um, being the cost of entry. I believe that it's part of the learning experience. And uh, I think I can only grow from here. <laughs> and did your, the, your comrades, your DA comrades, did they not step in to, to help you, knowing that it was very difficult your first time there? They're not, they're not allowed to. They themselves oh. just watch. In fact, they watched in amusement. Why you were doing so well? Why did you even pay attention to them? And um, <laughs> they, they, they were supportive and then and, 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 and encouraged me. And my, and my family actually also later on were highly encouraging. In fact, my sister wrote a whole thing about the good points that she saw there and that I should just not pay attention, too much attention to, to the negative, just learn from it because much of that speech had been positive and there was a lot to take away from it. So oh, it, it ended up. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And what about when you didn't realize that it, you it, the, uh, the decorum and that you were going to go into a very big congress, congressional room, not just a boardroom? I know that added to to the to the anxiety <laughs> because I, I'd been to a uh, committee meeting uh, earlier in the week, and committee meetings are formal, but they really are casual. That we had the minister there. We were in a boardroom with, with with not enough chairs, so there were people all over the. It, it just had a, a, an informality almost, even in the midst of the structure, and so it yeah and, and lighthearted. And then uh, there was this thing on the program that kept saying mini plenaries, mini plenaries. And first, and then I just knew I'd been told that I needed to make a speech, and had been guided in making that speech, but I did not have a clue that a mini plenary was actually parliament, actual parliament just broken down into, you know, bite-sized chunks. So I walk into this room and the first thing I notice is the seating and that the mics everywhere and the uh, political party positions are marked, not at all like the committee meeting earlier in the week. 
and um, and and everybody is formally dressed. Luckily, and you know, I've had everyone around me tell me this: just treat each day as a working day and dress formally. So I was appropriately dressed, but I was just not prepared, and so I needed to change my mind and kind of think, "Oh my god!" And then there were TV cameras. I had oh. not anticipated being on TV, but um, thankfully, I, I I was at least prepared to some extent and could pull it off hopefully with a measure of respectability mm. but I, I learned the lesson when it says mini plenary it means parliament <laughs> and, and be prepared for parliament well, it shows <laughs> you that you are very flexible um you know that uh, thinking about that i have also been caught out a few times when i've been asked to give a, a talk at different things and and i've been expecting <clears throat> like a small room maybe 20 people and you walk in and it's uh, this huge big area we'll get back to that shortly this is finding human with sue jackson only on 101.9 High FM. Hello, this is Sue Jackson and I'm with Sebo Bilakazi. And before we go any further, I actually just wanted to say that uh, if you want to get hold of um, Sebo on Lincoln, it, you really will enjoy his all his stories. I would like to just ask you, our time is going so quickly, but please just give out your, your email address. Uh, Thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. It is smonyv at gmail.com. And uh, this, that's S for sugar, B for bravo, O for orange, N for November, G for golf, I for ivory, V for victor at gmail.com. So smonyv at gmail.com is, is the email. And your, your WhatsApp number? Plus, okay, that would plus be two seven. Plus two seven seven two six three nine six five six seven. Great. And then your LinkedIn for uh, just look up Sebo Vilakazi. It's S comma B O and Vilakazi is V I L A K A Z I. That's right. Yeah, so it's S and an apostrophe. Apostrophe, B-O. Yeah, or yeah. just S-B-O, yeah. Mm. Uh, S for sugar, B for bravo, O for orange. So what is your next step forward now? Hopefully you'll be able to raise this money. And what is, what is the main thing that you are going to really concentrate on in your area, your constituency? It's... Um, Building support for the DA within within that constituency, we generally are uh, an, an entity there. In so far as um, the weight, uh, the, uh, by way of votes, but we are growing slowly. In fact, there's a little town called Saint Lucia, yeah. which makes ninety percent of its of its revenue through tourism. Tourism, mm. yeah. And uh, Saint Lucia is a sort of seventy eighty percent DA ward. And so it's growing, it's maintaining our support there, possibly even growing it, and then growing it amongst sort of the more rural, the more rural communities. And then it's taking up those issues. I really would love for the people to feel that now that we have a member of parliament representing our community, our lives are changing for the better. Mm -hmm. So even this past week, I was uh, attending to, I was, because of the access I now have, as far even as the ministers, this week I got to contact uh, uh, top officials, government officials, on an issue of water and sanitation that's been bothering the community of St. Lucia. And there are other such issues uh, throughout the, throughout the constituency, which really is uh, one of the districts within the within the province. So being able to do that and to make them feel that it adds value to their lives to have this represent re representation. So that's that's um, that's my one thing. The other thing is just to grow. I have had to kind of um, uh, take the approach that I'm going to look and listen first and just learn. This is in Parliament now. Mm. And ask lots of questions. 
And, you know, so that's the phase where I am now. But then I want to be able to start driving issues within Parliament and actually starting to feel like I'm making a, a positive contribution. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to be a backbencher, just somebody that's there to make up the numbers. I want the DA itself to feel that it did the right thing by putting me in there. And I want to feel that it was a step worth taking. So your voice will definitely be heard then? I intend for it to be. Mm-hmm. But it's got to be an intelligent voice. Right. Uh, I don't want to howl and just speak for the sake of um, making a noise. You know, I, I want to really bring intelligent discussion. I, but I also want to bring the compassion and the empathy that's been instilled into me through my work within the not-for-profit um, sector mm-hmm. and hopefully make a difference um, that way. In fact, just to mention quickly, the Parliament works through these portfolio committees and I have been assigned to the portfolio committee on communications and digital technologies, oh. which, I'm excited about, which I'm excited about because it's at the leading edge of economic development in this country. Wonderful. And so, I welcome anyone, particularly those within the country, if they have any issues to do with this portfolio, to contact me at the contact details that you've just given, and I'll happily take up those issues for them. Wonderful. To the extent that I can. I'm being told to wrap up, but I just wanted to just read uh, one paragraph of your Who Shall Stand. Who shall stand for the innocent? Who shall stand for the indigent? Who shall stand for the sleep? Deprived, who shall just sorry, I missed the page. Who shall stand for the here and now? And then, how do you pronounce the Lafa Elihila? Lafa Elihle. Okay. What is Cry that? the beloved country. Cry the beloved <coughs> country. Oh, okay. Our country burns before our very eyes. Our leaders don't care. Hearts are cold as ice. The cries of the people go unheard. There's no one to listen. The people suffer and die. No one cares. Compassion is missing. Violence and protests are the order of the day. The only option for many is uh, to get their way. And then you go on. And uh, it's beautifully written. If anyone wants to read it, you can find it on LinkedIn. The end, he says, so tell me, who shall stand for the innocent? Who shall stand for the indigent? Who shall stand for the sleep deprived? Who shall stand for the here and now? A compassionate leadership made up of you and I. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sebo, so much for being with me today. We will definitely do this again. And uh, I hope you get a good response. And I'm sure I will also. And hello, Mrs. Villakazi. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sue. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And it's been long. It glad has. To, yeah, glad to chat again. We and will definitely do things. it again. Thank you so much, Sebo.